Down the ancient stone steps of the dark, damp tower, I descended into the unknown. It was quiet. There weren't any sounds to give me a clue as to what would come next. But as I slunk quietly down the steps, I saw that the stairwell was opening up to another large, circular room. It did not have an iron chandelier like the room above, but rather a series of lit torches positioned along the wall. And in the center of the room, a man. He was sitting nude in a simple wooden chair. His hair was long and gray, with a beard to match. He was bone thin, and with skin pale as the moon. It was as if it hadn't seen the sun in years, maybe ever. Hello? I said as I gradually made my way down the steps. He did not answer. I considered proceeding on past him, but immediately saw that the remaining stairs were shut off behind a large wooden door, which had neither knobs or handles. The only hint that the door actually opened was the keyhole. I glanced over at the man to double check that he had not moved, and then stole a glimpse through the keyhole. More stairs. I turned my attention back to the man, realizing that if I were to continue any further, he was likely my only hope. Excuse me. I inched closer to him. He maintained his forward gaze without moving or speaking. I began to worry that perhaps he wasn't even breathing. Sir, I said again. Can you help me? Still, no response. I leaned next to him. I need to get out of the tower. He twisted his head in my direction slowly, and as he did so, I could hear the clicks and pops from his scarcely used joints. He didn't look at me so much as just faced me, and I soon recognized the cloudy gray color of his eyes as that of a blind man. He parted his lips as if to speak, but only let out a dry wheeze. His vocal cords had become dominant and weak over time. Eventually, he was able to faintly utter the words, He awaits upon his throne of blood and bone within the tower of ancient stone. The same lines I had read in the book upstairs. Who is he? I asked. The man did not react, and after a moment, repeated the same line. Yes, I said, growing impatient, but who is he? Once again, he repeated the words from the book. I'd become Frustrated, I raised my voice and finally asked, Well, how do I get to him then? The man rose from the chair, shaky and frail, joints popping. He lifted a necklace over his head that had been covered by his long beard. From the leather string dangled a large iron key. Hunched over with difficulty, the man staggered to the door and inserted the key into the lock. There was an exchange of noises that echoed through the room as he turned the key. The heavy door slowly drifted open, seemingly on its own, as if it were opened by some invisible force. The man hung the string back around his neck and receded to his chair. I leaned into the stairwell. What's down there? I asked, but the man reverted back to unflinching silence. I readied myself and continued my descent. As I tread further down the stairs, I could see that I was entering into another flame-lit space. The air felt thick and had a copper-like odor. 
I could hear what sounded like low moaning. I steadied myself against the dark stone wall and felt a wetness beneath my hand. I recoiled, and below the flickering light of the overhead torch, I saw that my fingers and palm were red. I gasped. The wall was coated entirely in blood, as if the stones themselves were sweating it. But then I noticed something. There were drops of red on my skin, on my clothes, and as I touched my clean hand to my face, my fingertips came away smeared with red. There was a lingering mist of blood in the air. My heart began to race. What was this? No single living thing bleeds enough to fill the air. Maybe it isn't actually blood, I thought, but it smelled like blood. It looked like blood. And as the stairwell opened up to the next room, my fears were confirmed. It was blood. This was not a room like the others. This was a massive chamber, hundreds of feet deep. The stairs spiraled wide and open along the walls down into a dark pit. Suspended from chains and shackled with their wrists above their heads were four people spaced evenly apart, extending from their slit open and bloodied abdomens were their intestines, stretched to their limit and tied together in a raw, meaty knot. Their legs appeared to have been freshly amputated, and from their gaping wounds, blood flowed continuously. Dear God, I said, I'd never seen something so disturbing, so gruesome, so... hellish. Was I in hell? The blood rained down into a dark void that my flashlight was unable to penetrate. I did not want to continue any further. There could be nothing good awaiting me. These were fresh bodies, fresh victims. I might be next. I decided to turn around, to hurry to the top and hope that Hannah would eventually get the stone hatch open. I'd wait all week if I had to. But as I returned to the large wooden door, I saw that it was closed. This side did not have any doors or handles either. I pounded my fist against the door. Let me in! I yelled. No answer. No movement that I could hear. Nothing. I pounded on the door until my arms ached and my hands were sore. Please. I began to weep. I should have listened to Hannah, God. What I would have given to be back on the surface with her, holding her, apologizing for being so stubborn, telling her that I'd never doubt her again. I wanted that. I needed that. I reluctantly turned from the door and headed back down the steps. I was feeling squeamish and drained of hope. Then I heard it again. A pained moan. I'd forgotten about it earlier when I was faced with the grisly sight. I moved down the steps a little more quickly. Who was crying? It sounded like more than one person. I was back out in the open. I focused on the chained nightmare hanging in the center of the chamber. And then I saw it. One of them let out a tormented groan. Then another raised his head, his face contorted in agony. They were alive. I wanted to call out to them, but what good would it do? I couldn't help them, and they certainly weren't in any condition to help me. I averted my gaze, feeling powerless and unsettled, and continued hesitantly down the slick stone steps. I forced the image from my head, and thought of Hannah's tender smile instead. I will return to you, I said under my breath. Confidence began to return to me. 
It warmed my blood and fortified my soul. I was getting out of that tower one way or another. The devil himself could not stop me from returning to the woman I love. If I had to, I'd kick down the gates of hell to be with Hannah again. My posture straightened. I clenched my fists, and with a new profound eagerness descended further into the darkness. And that's when I slipped. I had put my weight down on a particularly slimy part of the stairs and my foot shot forward, sending me tumbling down the wet stairway. To my right was walled and solid, but the left side was open and a straight drop into the dark. I did not know how far of a drop, or what was at the bottom. I bounced and rolled, ramming into the wall and sliding toward the edge. There was nothing to grab hold of, nothing dry enough for me to even press onto. I tried desperately to regain my balance, but I was tumbling too quickly. I was taking a beating, and although I wasn't really thinking and instead just trying to survive, part of me knew I'd be in rough shape regardless of whether or not I lived or died. I picked up quite a bit of momentum when I hit the wall one last time, and did so with enough force that I was propelled backwards and over the edge. My fear had just become reality. I was plummeting to my death, I realized, but the thought was brief. My body splashed into a puddle and landed hard against the solid ground. The air was heaved from my lungs, leaving me wide-eyed and gasping. My body tensed against the wet ground. I'd lived through the fall, but my breath had escaped, and I was worried that I wouldn't return. Then, as if a seal had been torn from my mouth, I gulped in a surge of wet, metallic air. I coughed, not sure whether I was choking on my own blood or someone else's, or both. The spasms eventually died down and my breathing began to steady as I sat up. The throbbing in my ears slowed. I was in the pitch black. I knew I was sitting in an almost ankle-high puddle of what was certainly blood. I could hear the dripping that came from the mutated bodies overhead. But there was another noise. Heavier. Sloshing in the puddle and an occasional patter. And then more sloshing. Finally, a potent splash sent a spray of droplets in my direction. Something was in there with me. I waded frantically through the blood, a blind and desperate search for my flashlight. Where was it? Could it still be on the stairs? Suddenly, my fingers brushed against a solid object. I gripped it and spun around. I clicked it on toward the noise. The blood-soaked lens bathed them in red light. Drenched, head to toe, were three women, dancing beneath the shower of blood. Their naked bodies swayed and twirled, stirring up waves in the gore around them. They moved with ecstasy, tossing their crimsoned hair back to let the blood wash over their faces. They were unfazed by my light, entranced in the moment like a group possessed. What the fuck was happening? I aimed the light around the room, looking for a door. There wasn't one. Solid wall all the way around. I wondered, is this the bottom? But then I noticed something. The blood was moving along my ankles draining slowly. I shined the light on it and realized that it was moving similarly to how you might see in a bathtub or a sink to the center between the sanguine dancers. I stepped carefully toward them, tracing the slow moving current of the blood. At their feet I saw what looked like a sewer lid it had small holes that the blood was draining through. 
holes that I could stick my fingers through and lift the lid. I held my breath and slid between the dancing women. Suddenly, their dance changed. They linked hands and encircled me. They began to let out a bone-chilling laugh as they skipped around me counterclockwise like children playing Ring Around the Rosie. I hastily lifted the lid and pushed it aside, anxious to leave the frightening scene behind. There was a ladder. I stepped down, the women still snickering around in circles. The ladder was, of course, very slippery from all the blood that had seeped down it. I carefully reached for my flashlight and pointed it at the dark below. Nothing. I began to descend, and then all of a sudden I lost my footing. My heart skipped a beat and I hooked my arms onto the ladder at the last second, dropping the flashlight in the process. It clanged off a metal rung, and I watched as it fell, becoming a distant speck, swallowed by the dark. I had a long ways to go.